Klaus, How Santa Claus Began, written by Grant Morrison and art by Dan Mora. All right, I wanted to cover a Christmas book on my channel, so I decided to cover Klaus by Grant Morrison. This book is sometimes called Klaus, How Santa Claus Began, or sometimes it's even referred to as Santa Claus Year One, which if you know your Batman comics is a little bit of a parody of Batman Year One, a very famous Batman story. So Klaus, or Santa Claus Year One, is essentially an origin story for a badass medieval Viking Santa Claus, and uh, he kind of has superpowers in a way, and it is a really fun book. And Grant Morrison, he's no slouch of a comic book writer. He's probably one of the most uh, popular comic book writers of the last 20 or 30 years or so. He's written some really popular books. I personally really loved his new X-Men run. I think one of the best X-Men runs ever. He also did All-Star Superman, one of the best Superman books ever. He did a Batman run, which I'm a little bit mixed on. It's a little crazy sometimes, but it is pretty cool. Sometimes, though, Grant Morrison really writes some kind of high-concept, convoluted stuff that I don't always like, but I'm happy to report that Klaus is, for the most part, pretty grounded and easy to follow and a highly enjoyable. So, let's dive into it. Klaus, How Santa Claus Began, slash Santa Claus Year One, and see Grant Morrison's take on a badass Viking medieval Santa. Issue One In medieval times, an independent fur trapper named Klaus is trekking through the snow, heading towards the walled town of Grimsvig to trade furs and hides. When Klaus enters the town, it seems very different than the last time he was here years ago. It used to be a happy town, now it seems more empty. Klaus talks to the bartender in a local pub and asks him, where are all the men? And the barkeep answers, they're all in the mine. Klaus is surprised, it's the Yule time festival. Don't they usually stop working in the mine during Yule time? The bartender explains, Coal is needed. Take it up with the Baron if you want. But my advice? Stop asking questions. Eventually, some armed guardsmen come for Klaus in the bar with spears. They tell him he is not welcome, and everything within the town's walls are the Baron's property, and they will be confiscating his furs. Klaus is not happy. He is marched out of the bar into the street where the guardsmen are loading up his furs. The guardsmen see a little boy playing with a rock, which seems a little bit odd. The guard asks the child, Is that some kind of toy? Hand it over! All toys are the property of the Master Jonas for his sole fun and pleasure. The guardsmen confiscate the boy's rock. Klaus finds this treatment of the child on the street a little ridiculous. Klaus, he insists that the guards pay him for his furs they are taking. Now, there's something going on in the street. We see a sign that says, It is forbidden to wish. So something is really oppressing the people here. Eventually, the guardsman smacks the boy. And this makes Klaus furious. He says to the guardsman, Enough! You dare strike a child, you coward! Klaus fights the guardsman but they outnumber and overpower him and badly beat him. And the child, though, he managed to run away. Up above on the wall overlooking Grimsvig, we see a man named Sergeant Karl Linkvist. He is the leader of the guardsmen, and he does not like watching the treatment of Klaus down below. Walking up to Karl is the ruler of this town and the man that gives Karl and the guardsmen their orders. This man is the evil, tyrannical Lord Magnus, the Baron of Grimsvig. Lord Magnus has conscripted nearly all of the townsmen to labor in the nearby coal mine, and has instructed his guardsmen to systematically deprive the townspeople of joy, including canceling the annual Yuletide celebration, and confiscating any toys and musical instruments to give to his spoiled young son, Jonas. Unlike Carl, Lord Magnus enjoys this treatment 
of this Klaus, this stranger in his town down below. Klaus is marched outside the town walls to be executed. But Klaus, as he is being marched, he whistles a tune, and that tune summons his white wolf pet named Lily. Lily attacks the guardsmen and scares them off. Klaus and Lily then retreat into the forest. Inside Grimsveg, we see Master Jonas, the son of Lord Magnus. Lord Magnus has basically taught his son to be a spoiled little shit, so Jonas is a terrible little monster. Jonas is the only boy in town allowed to have toys, and even though he has them, he seems to hate them all. Lord Magnus even had some local craftsmen spend all year crafting Jonas a beautiful miniature town. And Jonas right now is standing on top of that miniature town and smashing it to pieces. He hates it. All these toys are useless, boring, rubbish, he says. He insists that he hates Yule time. Magnus and his son Jonas join Jonas's mother for dinner. Jonas's mother is the Lady Dagmar. She is a beautiful woman with red hair. She seems deeply unhappy, however. We are left wondering how this woman found herself in this situation, married to this tyrant, Lord Magnus. The family sits down for dinner at a long table with what looks like a huge feast just for the three of them. Out in the forest in the dark of night, Klaus and his pet wolf, Lily, make camp for the night by a small fire. Klaus comments to Lily on what he saw in town, he says. Those poor children, they don't deserve to have their Yule time cancelled. Still, it's not our concern, I know, I know. There's nothing we can do. Let's play a tune for the Shining family. Klaus plays some music from a flute he has, and Lily howls along, almost singing. When Klaus falls asleep, he is visited by the spirits of the forest, and we can see this portrayed through a very psychedelic-looking color explosion. When Klaus wakes up, he is stunned to see that by him, the spirits of the forest have left behind a large bag of wooden toys. Some of them even seem a little bit magical. Klaus is not sure what he is supposed to do with this bag. Issue 2 Klaus is not happy that the children of Grimsveg were having their toys taken away, so he decides to do something about it with all these new toys he found given to him by the spirits of the forest. So that night, Klaus scaled the town's walls with a rope. He beat up a few guards within the town and vandalized a poster on a wall with an image of Lord Magnus. Klaus, he also distributed various toys to many children within the town. And in the morning, as the kids woke up, they found they had a whole bunch of toys and they were happy and playing with them. The kids' parents, who were living in rough times, toiling in the coal mines and under Lord Magnus's tyrannical rule, can't believe all of these toys. Some of the toys even seem magical, and there's a little wooden bird and it's flying around. Lord Magnus, seeing all the joy down below the toys are giving people, is furious, and he chastises his guardsmen for allowing this to happen, and he orders them to confiscate all of these new toys. Master Jonas is watching all the toys being confiscated from the children down below in the town. Jonas comments to his mother, It's not fair! Someone's having fun and I'm not! Lady Dagmar replies, I'm sure your father will put a swift end to any fun anyone might be having, dear. If he can't make a profit on it, he gets suspicious. He's very strict about fun. We see Klaus is still hiding within the town walls. He was not able to escape out of the town before morning. And we see in the street, Lord Magnus is yelling at the townsfolk, questioning them. He asks, one of you must know who distributed these things. A little poor girl in the street answers and says, It was the jewelerness, sir, the Yule time spirit. Lord Magnus, like the Grinch, crouches down and replies right in this girl's face and says, 
There is no such thing. And he storms off. Later that day, Jonas, he was given all of the new confiscated toys. And guess what? He hates them as well. All the magic that the toys seem to have down below, how they were almost coming to life and flying, well, they're not doing anything right now. The toys just laid there motionless. And Jonas says, it's not fair. Why won't they fly for me? What's wrong with me? Jonas, he then starts smashing the toys and breaking them. The sergeant of the guardsmen, Carl Linkvest, has his men on high alert this night. They are to find this mysterious man that gave all these toys out and caused all sorts of havoc today. Carl found a rope the mystery man used to climb the walls, so he will not be able to get out the same way he came in. Carl also puts one of his strongest guardsmen on patrol that night, a man named Olav the Unbeatable. Olav is an intimidating man in large stature. So that night, as Klaus is sneaking through the town and trying to get back out of it, he runs right into that Olav the Unbeatable, and Olav feeds Klaus a swift punch, and Klaus gets thrown back. Olav then gloats to Klaus, saying, You're no ghost, but soon you will be. You walked straight into a trap. Klaus, he manages to yank a rope that is laid out in such a way that it catches Olav's feet, and Olav falls backwards and hits his head and gets knocked out, upside down in a pile of snow. Later on that night, when Lord Magnus and some of the guardsmen are patrolling, they find Olav knocked out, and they see that Klaus has made him into a snowman, and Olav's feet are the snowman's arms. Lord Magnus is furious at the incompetence of Olav, and he yells to get this fool out of here. Magnus says that the mystery man dropped his sack, and it will have his scent, so he orders to call for the dogs to sniff him out. And we see the vicious dogs are now on the hunt, trying to sniff and find Klaus. And Klaus is still within the town walls. And the issue ends with the vicious dogs cornering Klaus. Issue 3 The dogs are chasing Klaus through the town streets. They are closing in on him, but Klaus gets saved by his pet wolf, Lily that arrives and scares all the dogs off. Klaus then climbs his way to the rooftops, where he will eventually leave the city walls and return to the forest. The guardsmen, surprised to see their dogs returned frightened, begin speculating on the nature of Klaus. They say that the intruder must be a wolfman or a ghost. They ask, what else could scare off a troop of war dogs? Down in the coal mines, the workers are growing skinny, malnourished, and are starting to go a little bit insane. One man yells, No! No one needs this much coal! I can't take it anymore! The voice, that terrible voice, calling his name over and over again, I, I can't do it! So there is some kind of supernatural voice echoing down there in the coal mines. The children of the town are writing their wishes on bits of paper and are sending the paper to rise up the chimneys into the sky. They are writing these wishes for the Santa, the mysterious figure that has been leaving them presents. In her castle, the Lady Dagmar is looking at a blue toy bird and is admiring it. The bird has some historical significance for her that we will soon learn about further on in the story. Dagmar's husband, Lord Magnus, he grabs the bird from his wife and he inspects it and he believes that the bird is a weapon and he smashes it. Klaus, back in the forest now with his pet wolf, Lily, feels that the spirits of the forest are calling him to a higher calling. So he plays the flute again and summons them for them to tell him the next steps they wish him to take. The Baron, Lord Magnus, now descends into the coal mine in Grimsvig. He is walking by tons of unhappy workers. Lord Magnus has now gone into the deepest part of the mine, where he is now speaking to this 
mysterious supernatural voice down there. Lord Magnus tells the voice, I've done everything you asked. I've remade Grimsvig to your exacting specifications, as a town without cheer. We're already working the men to death to meet your demands. Yes, we're a little behind schedule, but time is manpower. The longer I stand here waiting, the longer you remain imprisoned. The voice expresses its disappointment to Magnus in anger, and Magnus tells the voice, The townspeople are already on the verge of rebelling. They'll rip me apart if you even suggest that. And the Santa? He is being taken care of. Just give me the strength I need, and you'll see. So you're now starting to learn a little bit about why this Lord Magnus seems so evil. It is because he is following orders from this mysterious voice that must have promised Magnus great things. And in exchange, Magnus is to deprive the townspeople of joy, make them work exceptionally hard down here in the mines, as well as deprive his people in a few other ways. The next morning, Klaus does his next strike against Lord Magnus's rule. He sneaks back into the town and rings some large bells in what appears to be a church bell tower of some sort. The townspeople run outside to see the commotion, as the bells ringing give them some kind of hope. The bells are a signal of joy, something forbidden under the Baron's rule. The Baron, Lord Magnus, is yelling at his guardsmen and the townspeople. He says, Church bells ring out work shifts only. I gave strict orders. No bells, no light, no joy. Klaus then sneaks further into the town as he approaches a dead-looking pine tree, and he says to the tree, Remember me? I cut live wood from your branches once, dead tree. I made a symbol. So Klaus has some sort of history with this tree, and this tree has some sort of historical significance with this town. Klaus, he chops the dead tree down and lights it aflame. And when Lord Magnus sees this tree on fire, he exclaims, This means war! While Lord Magnus and most people are distracted with the on-fire tree, Klaus sneaks into the castle and visits the Lady Dagmar in her home. And he says, Hello, Dagmar. How long has it been? Issue 4 Through a flashback, we learn Klaus's story and his relationship to the Lady Dagmar and the town of Grimsvig. Many years ago, out in the forest, Klaus's parents froze to death. Klaus was just a baby at the time. Luckily, he was discovered in the arms of his frozen mother and was miraculously still alive. Klaus was saved by Carl Linkvist, the guardsman. Carl adopted the boy and named him Klaus, which means victory of the people. As Klaus grew up in the town of Grimsvig, he eventually befriended the Lord's daughter, Dagmar. One day, he saw Dagmar's pet bird died, and she buried the bird with her parents in the town square. Klaus, who was a good craftsman, carved her a new toy bird to replace her deceased pet bird. Dagmar responded positively to the gift, and the two of them soon became close friends, best friends even. Young Magnus, though, he wanted Dagmar for himself, and he looked on jealously at their friendship. Many years later, when Klaus was older, he eventually became captain of the town guard, and one day the town guards trapped three white wolves in a pit, as wolves are dangerous. Klaus, he heard a noise coming from some nearby trees, so he went to investigate the noise, and he found hiding in the tree branches a little white wolf cub. The rest of the guardsmen asked Klaus if he found anything. If Klaus spoke truthfully, he should have reported that he found the little white wolf cub and brought the cub to the pit to be killed with the other wolves. But Klaus instead decided to spare the little wolf cub's life. Klaus, he lied to the rest of the guardsmen and claimed he found nothing. He says he was mistaken, he heard no noise. That wolf cub that he saved, that he spared, was Lily. Later on, as part of a conniving scheme, young Magnus poisoned the baron of the town. 
the Baron was named Baron Alric. Baron Alric was the father of Lady Dagmar. Magnus was able to kill Baron Alric by giving him some poison that the Baron thought was medicine. When Baron Alric died, Lord Magnus somehow framed Klaus for the murder, for the poisoning. He claimed that Klaus had plotted to take Baron Alric's place. And Lady Dagmar, she actually believed Magnus and looked at Klaus with disgust. She told him, He loved you like a son! You are my friend! How could you do this? Klaus was stripped of his warm clothes and sent shirtless to go march outside the town walls to die in the snow from the cold. Klaus, he marched, and he eventually passed out. And he would have died, but he was found by the wolf, Lily. The very wolf he saved many years earlier when she was just a little wolf cub. Lily kept Klaus alive. That is the end of the flashback. We assume that Klaus spent many years outside the walls of Grimsvig by himself in the wild. In Grimsvig now, Klaus and the Lady Dagmar are talking. Dagmar still believed that Klaus killed her father, but Klaus protests his innocence. He says that he would not dare show his face here now to her if he actually had any part in killing her father. He says that he was living alone and wild and he was safe, but he saw what was happening to the people of Grimsvig, how they were being ruled poorly by this Lord Magnus, and he couldn't just stand by and watch it happen. And that is why he returned now. Dagmar asks Klaus why didn't he put up a fight all those many years ago when he was accused of killing her father. Klaus answers, why did I give in? Why did I run away and never return? Because you chose Magnus over me. Lady Dagmar expresses regret. She says, they, they told me you were dead. I should have known. Klaus tells Dagmar that he has a plan. He says to her, you used to dream about how we'd make Grimsvig a better place. Maybe it's time to start. Klaus then gives her a gift for her son, Jonas. He then tells her, Merry Yule time, my lady and Klaus takes off. In his quarters, Jonas is smashing more toys because they are not magical. Lady Dagmar joins her son and gives Jonas the toy that Klaus made for him. The toy is a little scarecrow looking action figure of some sort. Jonas, his immediate inclination is to smash the toy, but Dagmar sits down and encourages Jonas to tell a story with the toy, because if he smashes the toy, he can't play with it anymore. Jonas is apprehensive at first, but then he starts coming around to the idea, and before you know it, the two of them are playing happily, playing make-believe, and are having a good time. But then, Lord Magnus arrives, and drags his son Jonas away. He needs something from Jonas. Down in the coal mines, the guardsmen were given orders by Lord Magnus to kill a few of the workers that were really complaining the most about the working conditions, and to make an example out of them, as to keep the others in line. Carl Linkvist watches his other guardsmen do this, and he is horrified by what he sees. The supernatural voice in the mind can be heard saying, Free me! Free me! Carl Linkvist returns home that night, distraught and ashamed at how far Lord Magnus has corrupted this town, and him as well. In Carl's home, he finds Klaus there. Carl admits his regrets in supporting Lord Magnus over the years. At first, he just held his tongue and deceived himself into thinking that he could change things from the inside. But then he discovered he became a part of the problem. And now the whole town lives to serve Lord Magnus and his insane schemes, and no one dares to fight him. Carl then points to his uniform and says, This uniform? These colors, red and white? They used to mean something. And Klaus tells him they will again. I'm throwing a Yule time party and everyone's invited. So the two of them are now scheming to work together to 
take down Lord Magnus. Back over to Lord Magnus, he has his son Jonas write a letter, making a wish to this Santa. The letter has to be written in a child's hand to seem believable. The letter is all part of an elaborate trap Magnus is scheming to capture Klaus. Issue 5 Jonas admits to his mother, Dagmar, that his father scared him into writing a letter to trick the Santa, the Yuletime spirit. Magnus then enters the library where Dagmar and Jonas are. Magnus looks especially crazed now. Magnus, crazed but also worried and paranoid, admits what he has done to his wife. He talks about the voice in the black rock and the passages in his black book and how he has been preparing Grimsvig for its arrival and in return it will give him strength. In two days time, the king will come and Magnus suspects the king will try and kill him once he sees how tyrannical a ruler he has been. Magnus, he needs to free that creature in the Black Rock now, so that the creature can make him all powerful, and then he will be no match for any men, or army, or even king, and he can become a king himself, and Dagmar his queen. Elsewhere, we see Klaus traversing the city's rooftops at night, dropping gifts of toys down various chimneys. Klaus then descends into the coal mines and beats up some of the guardsmen acting like slave drivers, and he tells the miners down there in the mine that they are now free, and they should go home to their families and celebrate. Celebrate the return of light from darkness, the way it is meant to be. The miners are inspired. They ask Klaus to lead them, and Klaus tells them, Do I look like a leader? All I do is bring toys for children, to make sure joy won't be forgot. This gift is yours, so take it. The miners set the mine on fire, and they yell, Spread the word! Your baron's grip is weakening! They also warn about the fire engulfing the coal mine right now, and say, Fire! Fire! In the pit! Back to Magnus and Dagmar talking. Dagmar thinks the voice is just something made up by Magnus something in his head, but Magnus continues talking all crazed, but how the voice will give him power, knowledge, and wealth. He also is a little bit angry and sad, and feels that Dagmar only ever loved him because he cast a spell on her. The two argue some more. Dagmar says she no longer wants anything to do with Magnus. Eventually they get interrupted and are informed that the mines are on fire and the night shift has been recalled. Magnus, he storms into action. Klaus is sitting on a rooftop in town. In the distance, we see the fire from the mines. Klaus, he reads that fake letter that Magnus forced young Jonas to write. In the letter is a fake tale all about some poor child with a sob story, and all he wants for Yule time is a pet wooden horse. Klaus, he decides to fulfill this child's wish and he travels to the house where the boy in the letter said that he lived. Klaus, when he arrives in that house, he finds Carl Linkvist tied up there. Klaus knows that this was a trap set for him. A whole bunch of guardsmen still loyal to Magnus start attacking Klaus. Klaus, he scurries up some steps in the home, fighting through some guards along the way. Klaus, he then jumps out the window trying to get away and he starts running. The guardsmen have been equipped with poison arrows courtesy of Lord Magnus and they start firing on Klaus. A few of the poison arrows hit Klaus in his back, but Klaus is still running. He falls off a rooftop, through a window, and into someone's home. Klaus, he is badly injured, he yells for some nearby civilians to help him. The poison arrows are making him weak and slow. The guards continue their pursuit of Klaus, and Klaus, he forces himself to get up and keep going. He continues running, running through that building and out another window, and that window leads to a steeply declining roof. Klaus, he falls down the steep roof, which then puts him into a freefall, but luckily he manages to grab onto a giant ceremonial banner 
and he uses that to slide down the rest of the way to the ground down below. There, on the ground, Klaus, he runs into a little boy named Finn Mickelson. Finn, he thinks Klaus is the mysterious Santa hero, so he offers him shelter in his family's home. Only when they get to Finn's home, Magnus' guards are all over the place, and they are actually taking children away from their parents. And they are telling the parents that this is for their own safety. All around town, Magnus' guards are removing children from their parents' home and taking them to Magnus' castle for what seems like unknown reasons at the moment. Well, Klaus and Finn can't go back to Finn's home. So Klaus tells Finn that he won't make it. He's too slow because of the poison. He can't do it alone. He needs roots, a star-shaped flower. He has to reach the forest. He has to reach his home. There he has some herbs that can heal him. Finn manages to help Klaus get out of the town of Grimsvig and into the woods. And there they meet Klaus's pet wolf, Lily. And using a little sled and with Lily pulling it, they manage to drag Klaus deeper into the forest, hopefully to his home, to the roots and flowers he needs to stop the poison. We see Magnus and some of his guards are on the trail of Klaus. They know Klaus is sick and is trying to get away, but he can't be that much further now. Magnus, with his guards, is going to make sure that Klaus dies soon. This is personal to him now. He does not want Klaus ruining his future plans. Issue 6 Lily and Finn have successfully brought Klaus back to his little cabin in the woods. Inside the cabin, Klaus has the herbs he will need to fight the poison. He mixes himself up a concoction, and he eventually starts feeling better. While Klaus is eating herbs and recuperating, Lily and Finn go for a walk around the cabin. Eventually, Magnus and his guardsmen arrive. They shoot Lily with their arrows, and Lily goes down injured. Klaus is eventually attacked and knocked out. And when he wakes up, he finds himself tied to the ice with ropes keeping his arms and legs in place. And the ropes are then nailed down onto the ice with spikes. Magnus gloats, the wolf will be shot and stuffed, the miners will work until they fall, and I will keep my appointment with the crown, referring to the king that will be arriving soon. Magnus continues, you thought you could stagger from the wilderness, stinking of raw meat, to steal my wife and enfeeble my son? You honestly believed you could turn my people against me? You, a filthy outcast who fled? Your boy there will feed my dark accomplice. He is referring to this Finn Mickelson that helped Klaus get to his cabin. Magnus continues, And as for your own spirit allies, medicine man, I trust they'll keep you warm and cozy. Magnus then departs to leave Klaus to die. By the way, this is a typical bad guy faux pas. Just kill Klaus if you want him dead. Don't leave things to chance. You know Klaus is most likely not going to die here. Magnus, he returns to Grimsvig, and he brings Finn with him, and tosses Finn in with all of the other kids they have taken away from their parents' home. All of the kids seem to be engorging themselves on candies and sweets supplied to them by Lord Magnus. Finn is suspicious about this, though. Magnus has never handed out free stuff. He must be trying to fatten up all of them for some reason. Down in the coal mines, one of the miners is pounding away on the rock, and he eventually cracks the wall of the mine and releases the source of this supernatural voice, the monster within. The monster within is the demon known as Krampus. I'm not that familiar with Krampus myself, but Krampus in German pop folklore is like a half-goat, half-demon monster that punishes misbehaving children at Christmas time. So with the crack now open, Krampus is able to claw his way out, and Krampus then starts asking, where are the children? 
So the children, Lord Magnus, has been taking away from their parents and have been fattening up with candy is a gift for Krampus. In Magnus's castle, the king and some of his men arrive to greet Lord Magnus in his dining hall, and the king is not happy. The king declares, Baron Magnus of Grimsvig, your people live in squalor while you luxuriate in splendor. Your laws are inhuman and arbitrary. One of the king's loyal soldiers tells Magnus, We've come to arrest you or make war if you resist. Stand up in the presence of your king, you dog. Surrender yourself. Magnus, he is feeling cocky, though. He knows his dark accomplice, Krampus, is free now. So he stays seated and explains, Oh, I have a painful back condition. Confines me to my chair, Baron Bjorn. But here I am, unarmed, while you march into my hall with your legions. My people starved to provide a feast fit for a king and his noble lords. You've all traveled a very long way. Wouldn't you prefer to eat before it all turns nasty? I promise a genuinely unforgettable Yule time celebration. The king's soldiers say, enough, Lord Magnus. You know why we've come. Reports of cruelty, black magic, exorbitant taxes. While they are berating Magnus, Krampus finally enters the dining hall, and Magnus introduces him and says, Ah, raise your cups to the new spirit of Yule time. On your knees, noble lords, or die where you stand. Krampus walks in looking very terrifying, like a demon straight out of hell, and he says, Hungry, children, you said, children. Krampus is yelling at Magnus to provide him the children he was promised. He then breathes some fire. Outside Grimsvig, Klaus is dying on the ice. Lily comes to visit him and licks his face. She still has some arrows in her and is injured. Klaus, instead of dying though, is once again visited by the forest spirits. And the spirits do some sort of magical bullshit to him and transform him and imbue him with some like magical Santa superhero powers and they tell him to make things better. Issue 7, the conclusion of Klaus. Krampus is in the dining hall blowing fire. The only child in the room in sight of Krampus is the young Jonas, Magnus's son. Krampus knocks Dagmar aside and grabs Jonas in his hands. Magnus tells Krampus, no, this isn't what we agreed to, not my son. Krampus, he doesn't care. He says, they're all mine. Hungry, I said. Magnus replies, I set you free. I summoned you to do my bidding. The Black Book commands you. The Black Book doesn't do shit, though. Krampus, almost mocking Magnus, says, command me? Go ahead, command me, my Lord Magnus. Magnus says, all my life I took my arms in your name. I did everything in return for power. You said I would be king. Krampus replies, King, you're a weakling, a slave to a voice in your head. I used you to break free. My power is mine and mine alone. Dagmar fires an arrow at Krampus and Krampus hurt drops Jonas and Jonas begins running away and he turns a corner in the castle. He eventually runs into the other kids that were kidnapped. They manage to escape the room they were locked in. Jonas, he's with them now, and Krampus, he followed Jonas, and he sees the other kids. And he says to the children in his booming demon voice, Selfish children, greedy children, swollen on sweets and candies, get into my sack! Jonas, feeling terrible for everything he did in his life and how he treated people and was selfish, tells Krampus, but it's me he wants, he's right, I'm a bad person. Take me and spare them. Oh, Jonas, get out of here with your last minute redemption arc. <laughs> Krampus starts getting attacked by some of the coal miners that have made their way into the castle. 
one of the coal miners stabs Krampus in his back. The children start running away out of the castle back to their parents. Krampus, his reign of terror, is not over though. He follows the children outside of the castle, and he says, Run forever, it's too late! Nothing can save you from me! But that is when the new version of Klaus arrives. The spirits of the forest have turned Klaus into his fully super-powered up Santa form, and Klaus is riding a flying sleigh in the air, being pulled by several white flying wolves, and lightning is coming down from the sky. It is really badass. Klaus, he leaps off his flying sled and lands on Krampus and stabs Krampus in his chest multiple times. Klaus is yelling, open your eyes monster, face the end. But Lord Magnus, still holding out hope that Krampus will give him power and aid him, stabs Klaus in his back with a giant sword that sticks out right through his chest. Klaus, he kneels down on the ground in pain, and Magnus turns to Krampus and says to the demon, I saved your life, it's time to pay up, time to deliver on your promises. I want my kingdom, I want my crown, and I want my people to love me. And then Magnus, now sounding more desperate, says, I want my wife and son to love me. Dagmar tells her husband Magnus all this, all this horror that surrounds you, see what you've done? And Magnus says to his wife, I sacrificed everything for you. I thought it was the voice, but I did it all myself. I'll be king and you'll be queen and our son a prince. Dagmar to this says, you murdered my father and you hunted Klaus to his death. You surrender to a monster, Magnus. It's over. We're finished. Magnus then turns to the demon and yells, You owe me! I want what I deserve! And Krampus, he gives Magnus exactly what he deserves. He spits hot fire on Magnus and incinerates him. He kills Magnus as the flames devour his flesh and bones. The townspeople watching this actually cheer. The Baron's dead! Praise the monster! <laughs> Klaus is still alive though. He walks through some smoke and speaks to the Lady Dagmar. Dagmar asks how Klaus isn't dead. She saw Magnus stab a sword right through him. And Klaus explains, something happened to me out on the ice. The Shining family brought me to a house behind the Northern Lights. I can't be killed now. I'm still not sure what that really means. We'll see. Krampus then brings his attention back to Jonas. There are some chains, and he throws those chains and wraps it around Jonas's legs and pulls Jonas in closer to him. Krampus then seizes Jonas and somehow converts Klaus's sleigh along with the white wolves that were pulling it, converts that into a dark chariot pulled by hellhounds, and then he flies that dark chariot into the sky and he declares that all bad children belong to me. Krampus plans on traveling the whole world, hunting wicked children. Klaus, though, he runs and manages to grab on to the bottom of Krampus's converted hell sleigh. The two of them on the hell sleigh fly high up into the air into the upper atmosphere. Klaus and Krampus are now face to face in the air. Krampus is going to breathe his fire breath onto Klaus, but when Krampus tries to blow some fire, he is only able to spit out some weak smoke. Klaus tells Krampus, Oh, such a wickedness, I'll give you this beast. You've made me want to laugh for the first time in too many years. Do you know what else is funny? Up here, your fires don't burn. And then Klaus, with his trademark, Ho, 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 beheads Krampus with his magical sword, decapitating him. The demon's body plummets back to the earth. And eventually, Klaus returns, triumphant, in a now restored sleigh, with the boy Jonas still alive. When they land on the ground, Jonas runs over to his mom and embraces her. In the aftermath, a new kind of Christmas tree is planted in the town square, and Dagmar promises the king that, with Klaus as her advisor, 
she will act as regent of the town and undo her husband's wickedness. And the king replies, My lady, we will attend to your progress with great interest. Now, as regards to this epic feast your husband promised, and they all have a huge feast and celebrate, and the Yuletide Festival is held every year from then on, and the town of Grimsvig slowly recovered its joy. Even Jonas abandoned his selfishness and learned to play with all of the other children. As the years passed, Dagmar grew old, and Klaus remained the same age. They lived a happy life together. Eventually, Dagmar passed from old age, and after her funeral, Jonas, now middle-aged himself and the new lord of the town, sees Klaus preparing to depart in his sleigh to bring joy to the rest of the world outside of Grimsvig. Jonas gives Klaus a toy bird and tells Klaus she wanted you to have this. Klaus tells Jonas, We'll be back, Lily and I, once every year with gifts for the children at Yule time. I promise we won't forget. And Jonas asks, But there are 364 more days in the year, Father. Where will you go? What will you do? And Klaus answers, It's a big world, and the sky goes on forever, Lord Jonas. I'll just have to use my imagination. Watch for me when the nights are long and the days grow cold. When there is need of a light in the darkness. Klaus, he then takes off in his sleigh and begins flying in the air, and the townspeople wave goodbye to him. On the final page, we see Klaus flying in his sleigh way above the earth, basically in space, with the sun peeking out in the background. And that is the end of Klaus. So that was Klaus, How Santa Claus Began, and I thought this book was great. I absolutely loved the artwork by Dan Mora. He actually got nominated for an Eisner in 2017 for Best Penciler Slash Inker. So it just goes to show I'm not the only one that appreciates his work on this book. Now, I really like the story in Klaus, and I really appreciate Grant Morrison's uh, creativity in taking the Santa Claus tradition and myths and uh, being able to twist it into this kind of interesting superhero take on Santa. And it was quite fun. I liked this Lord Magnus and Jonas and how they were oppressing the people in the town and Klaus saves the day and the demon Krampus coming into the story and Santa Claus having this epic battle with him in the sky. So that was all quite fun. I honestly think if there was a movie adaptation of Klaus, and it was done right. It could be an all-time Christmas classic that we watch every year on TV. You know, I'm just saying, I see the potential there for this. So, I really enjoyed this book. I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week with more comics.